When humanity made the great transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture and farming, allowing civilization to rise and advance, the crop at the heart of that transition was wheat. Wheat presented the possibility of staying in one location and building up food reserves instead of having to track and hunt for food exclusively. And this paved the way for villages, towns, and cities to rise up. It could be argued that wheat is one of the most significant natural resources of all time, with a history stretching back tens of thousands of years. This essential commodity was responsible for both the rise and fall of the mighty ancient Egyptian empire, playing a major role in not only providing year-round sustenance to its citizens, but also in commerce and even religion and spirituality. Though the wheat we grow and harvest today is a far cry from the wheat our ancestors consumed, largely due to genetic manipulation as agriculture was commercialized, it still remains a staple food source in many nations. In today's world, the global wheat supply is being put under duress by the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and concerns about its availability and price have started to bring to the forefront just how important wheat is to sustaining the world's growing population. On today's episode, we seek to find the grains of truth within this commodity that has been feeding us all for millennia. It's wheat on Commodity Culture. The cultivation of wheat stretches back approximately 10,000 years, and wheat's overall history as a food source goes back much further, with milling operations from Asia being discovered by archaeologists that date back 75,000 years. In terms of humanity's consumption of the grain, we can go back even further in time, as prehistoric hunter-gatherer humans discovered wheat grain was edible and so foraged for it along with fruits and vegetables. In today's world, wheat takes up more farmland than any other crop on the planet, with over 500 million acres being devoted to the plant, yielding approximately 750 million metric tons per annum. Wheat plants have long slender leaves and stems that are hollow in most varieties. The inflorescences, meaning a group or cluster of flowers arranged on a stem, contain varying numbers of tiny flowers, ranging from 20 to 100 in number. These flowers are born in groups of two to six in structures called spikelets, which later hold the subsequent two or three grains produced by the flowers. The plant needs to grow to its full height to develop flowers, where reproduction takes place, ensuring wheat's genetic destiny in the form of seeds. This process takes place in four phases. The first phase is called tillering. In this phase, the subsurface crown produces leaves and lateral branches known as tillers. Next is the stem extension phase, where the plant grows up to its full height through a series of stem segments connected to each other by nodes. Following this is the heading phase, where the stem terminates in a head or spike at the top of the plant. At this point, each head fertilizes its own flowers due to the movement of pollen from the male stamen, the pollen producing part of the flower, to the female stigma, the part of the plant where pollen germinates. Next up, grain develops in the final step, the ripening phase, and then the plant begins to wither and die. Each grain or kernel of wheat consists of a wheat plant embryo called a germ, encased in a thick outer coating called the bran, and fueled by the protein-rich endosperm. These resources nurture and protect the wheat germ, causing it to sprout from the soil into a new wheat plant. The reason that wheat has become such an important dietary staple across the world is due to its resilience, as it is able to be grown in many different types of soils and climates. Although it can thrive in a variety of environments, wheat is best adapted to temperate regions with rainfall between 30 and 90 centimeters. The two major types of the crop are winter and spring wheat, with the severity of the winter determining whether a winter or spring type is cultivated. Winter wheat is always sown in the fall, whereas spring wheat is usually sown in the spring but can be sown in the fall in areas where winters are mild. The earth is home to thousands of varieties of wheat, but the most common varieties are as follows. Triticum aestivum, also called common wheat. 
This variety is used for flour and bread making and is believed to have originated in the Middle East's Fertile Crescent. Today, farmers cultivate nearly 100 of the 200 known varieties of common wheat, which are classified as hard or soft, red or white, and winter or spring. Triticum durum. Durum wheat primarily ends up as semolina, the grains used to make macaroni, spaghetti, and other pastas. There are eight known varieties. Triticum compactum, also called club wheat, is a subspecies of Triticum aestivum. Club wheat produces a softer flour and is mostly used in crackers, cookies, cakes, and pastries. In addition to the wide variety of edible products made from wheat, it also sees some industrial use. The starch from wheat is used to improve the strength of paper. In the U.S. alone, the paper manufacturing industry uses over 5 billion pounds of starch every year. Wheat gluten is also used in the pharmaceuticals industry to create the capsules that hold medicine. Wheat is also used to produce bioethanol, a fuel alternative frequently used as motor fuel or as an additive in gasoline, but it plays a relatively small role in this compared to crops like corn. Finally, wheat germ, which contains lots of vitamin E, is commonly used in soaps and creams. So now that we know what it is and how it is planted, let's find out how wheat is harvested. Let us now explore and contrast the methods of harvesting wheat by hand and the more modern technologies used by large-scale and commercial farmers in the modern era. When harvesting by hand in ancient times, and even in some places today, the trusty scythe or sickle is used to cut down the wheat stalks when it comes time to gather the crop. As wheat is cut, it is collected into bundles, tied up, and stacked on the field into formations called stooks, which allows for ideal drying. The wheat loses water weight as it dries, allowing it to store longer. Stooks allow air to circulate around the wheat heads, quickly drying the wheat. After drying is complete, the wheat needs to be threshed. This is the process of separating the wheat kernels, or berries, from the flour, and one of the main old-school methods of doing this is to strike it repeatedly with a wooden flail. After this is complete, there will still be some flour and wheat husks, or chaff, mixed in with the kernels. Winnowing is the process of separating the wheat kernels from the chaff, and the traditional method of doing this is waiting for a decent wind flow and pouring the kernels and chaff into a bucket from around chest level. Since the chaff is so much lighter than the kernels, the wind will blow it apart, and the result will be mostly kernels only ending up in the bucket. Seeing as this process often needs to be repeated several times, in modern times when electricity is a thing, using a fan can help speed up the process. For small plots of land and people who just like to do it all themselves, the time-honored method is still effective, although time-consuming. But for larger fields and commercial production, a machine called a combine harvester greatly speeds up the process and allows much larger plots of wheat to be harvested. A combine harvester takes all the steps from harvesting by hand and combines them into one ultra-efficient machine. There is a lot going on inside a combine harvester gears, blades, conveyors, belts, augers, levers, and wheels that all work together to cut, thresh, and winnow wheat in one smooth operation. Combine harvesters often work alongside tractors pulling grain carts, in which the wheat kernels are deposited at a blazing fast rate of around three bushels of wheat per second. The cart allows the grain to be collected and then deposited into semi-trucks before returning to the side of the harvester to keep the operation going. This ensures that a larger area of wheat can be harvested in a timely fashion. After the semi-trucks are full, the wheat kernels are then transported to a grain silo or elevator for storage. The wheat is later processed into various grades of flour by cleaning, tempering, grinding, sifting, and purifying before being sold to the baking industry. Perhaps there is no empire so iconic in which wheat played such a big role as ancient Egypt. Wheat was at the center of both the rise of the Egyptian empire and its eventual downfall. 
Evidence of wild grain harvesting along the vast Nile River, including the use of sickles and grinding stones to harvest and process wheat, stretches back at least to the Mesolithic period between 18,000 and 15,000 BC. As the years advanced and the Egyptian empire grew, it was largely fueled by wheat, along with barley, as both were staples of the Egyptian diet. Bread and beer served many roles in society, from a major form of sustenance to a fundamental ingredient in medicinal remedies, a form of compensation, and even an offering to the gods. Barley and wheat thus played an indispensable role in building the empire and ensuring the survival of the Egyptian people. The geography of the area was ideal for agriculture to flourish, and the Nile River lent itself to the bountiful cultivation of grains. The annual floods from the Nile provided both fertilization and irrigation, as the floods deposited nutrients into the surrounding soils, and the Nile was also diverted into channels for irrigation of the land. Thanks to microscopic evidence from ancient Egyptian archaeological remains, we know their methods of processing barley and wheat into beer and bread were highly sophisticated. Due to the arid Egyptian climate, a vast record of organic materials has been preserved, including loaves of bread over 5,000 years old. Through studying these materials, Egyptologists have discovered that ancient Egyptian bread and beer were a far cry from the bread and beer we enjoy today. The beer of ancient Egypt was brewed using a unique fermentation process, and they produced many varieties which had a high nutrient value, including high amounts of protein and soluble fiber, along with vitamins from the yeast. Their bread came in a variety of shapes and sizes, but was generally rather coarse and far more dense than the spongy textured bread available to us now. As with the beer, bread from this era was more nutrient dense, a stark contrast to the mostly empty calories contained in the packaged breads mass produced in our modern era. In addition to being an essential part of daily meals for everyone from peasants all the way up to the pharaoh himself, bread and beer also formed the basis of a complex bartering economy, making them one of the earliest forms of currency. Workers' wages were often paid in bread and beer, and commodities were often valued in relation to loaves of bread or measures of grain. Though we couldn't conceive of it today, wheat actually served as an economic yardstick in their otherwise moneyless economy, allowing commerce to flourish. The spiritual significance of wheat was also front and center in the Egyptian people's religious beliefs. Osiris was one of the most worshipped gods and embodied agriculture. In fact, the cycles of agriculture were thought to mirror their beliefs about the life cycle of Osiris. The annual cycle of flood, planting, harvest, and fallow was thought to represent the birth, growth, death, dismemberment, burial, and resurrection of the god. Sadly, this sacred cycle was eventually disrupted, proving to be catastrophic, and the great famine that felled the mighty empire of Egypt around 2180 BC left desperation, hopelessness, and outright madness in its wake as the population struggled to stay alive through it all. A sudden and unexpected reduction in the annual flooding of the Nile came upon the land, due to a change in climate that pushed the African monsoon southwards out of Ethiopia. This alteration of such a key piece of agriculture and wheat cultivation caused so much damage over two to three decades that Egypt's food supplies were decimated, and starvation spread across the land like a malignant cancer. Famine gripped old Egypt and strangled her, paralyzing political institutions and leaving the land lawless as desperate citizens resorted to murder and cannibalism in an attempt to survive. This chilling record, written by a sage named Ipuwer, puts the terror of that era into perspective. Lo, the desert claims the land. Towns are ravaged. Upper Egypt became a wasteland. Lo, everyone's hair has fallen out. Lo, great and small say, I wish I were dead. Lo, children of nobles are dashed against walls. Infants are put on high ground food is lacking. Wearers of fine linen are beaten with sticks. Ladies suffer like maidservants. Lo, those who were entombed are cast on high grounds. Men stir up strife unopposed. Groaning is throughout the land, mingled with laments. See now, the land deprived of kingship. What the pyramid hid is empty. The people 
are diminished. As horrible as this famine is to imagine, it is far from a thing of the past, as an estimated 9 million people die of hunger every year in the world today. With the recent invasion of Ukraine, the fifth largest grain exporting country in the world, by Russia, the biggest grain exporting country in the world, this may put global food supplies in a precarious position in the years ahead. The U.S. is second to Russia on wheat exportation, and under more stable circumstances would likely be able to fill the gap left by a potential stranglehold on exports from Russia and Ukraine. However, sky-high fertilizer and diesel prices at home in America make the proposition to harvest more wheat, even at high wheat prices, a double-edged sword. In addition, a lackluster harvest last year has left grain storage in the U.S. at its lowest levels in 14 years, and continuing droughts are affecting production in key winter wheat states such as Kansas. It seems a perfect storm has brewed for a potential worldwide shortage of this critical commodity, and much higher prices for your average loaf of bread. Seeing as wheat accounts for 20% of all calories consumed by humankind, this scenario is bad news all around. Unfortunately, the poorest countries and lowest income households will be hit the hardest as they devote a lot more of their overall income to food staples. Recently, India has thrown its hat in the ring as a new major exporter of wheat to help ease supply shortages. Steps being implemented by the government there include ensuring government-approved laboratories test the quality of wheat for export, making extra rail wagons available for transport, and ensuring port authorities give priority to wheat exports. Exports of wheat from India have already risen massively, from 1.12 million tons in 2020 up to 6.12 million tons in 2021, and the goal now is to get 10 million tons out to the world after the new harvest season begins. Let us hope that India's efforts prove fruitful and can help bridge the gap in global wheat supply brought on by the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Better yet, let us hope for an end to the conflict so supply chains can be re-established, peace can be restored, and wheat can once again flow freely from those nations. Without wheat, it is very likely human civilization would have never been able to settle, build empires, and advance to where we are today. This humble grain is easy to overlook, as we are so accustomed to seeing it all around us and it being readily available. But as recent events have revealed, we should not take wheat for granted, lest the fate of ancient Egypt be brought upon us in the modern era. Commodity Culture is a series on commodities and natural resources. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you're always up to date with the latest episodes.